Welcome to Dental Nachos TV. You are going to meet uh, me and face Dr. Nacho, my amazing guest soon, but I want to share with you a few previews to our show. If you want to take your restorative skills to the next level, our amazing sponsor, Ripe Global, allows you to practice dentistry from your operatory on lifelike models. I've described it as the basketball gym we all need to succeed and become better dentists. Check out Ripe by texting Ripe to 215 543 six, four, five, four. If you're out there and you have too many patients, too many hygiene checks, you want more free time with your family, text hire to 215-798-9897 or visit dentistjobconnect.com. We are bonding, dental pun intended, dentist together daily, and we would love to help you. Whether you're out of dental school looking for your first or currently working in an associateship that is not working out, we would love to help you find the right fit for your associateship. Text job to 215-798-9897 or reach out to us at dentistjobconnect.com. And all of us need help learning how to survive, thrive, and not cry in the real world of dentisting. The Dental Nachos and Dentist Job Connect team have put together a guide to help you do just that. It is totally free to read. Just text SURVIVE to 215-543-6454. So I am Dr. Paul Goodman, and I want to welcome my guest, the amazing Dr. Michael Frazes. He is coming to us from Australia. Welcome to start your video, Michael, and we can chat for a few minutes as the before we turn it over to you. So Michael, Hello. it is it is a wine down time here in the U.S. W i n e d o w n. I think I've invented that term. I don't know. We have to we have to fact check that. And you are making a cup of coffee, one of my other uh, favorite drinks. So I believe dentists are people too. Not many people think of us as people, right? But we're people too. So tell us a little bit about Dr. Michael, the person, before we get into Dr. Michael, the professional. Well, uh, where do I start? I like long walks on the beach mm. and coffee. No. Um, yeah. So like like you said, I'm a person as well. I've got a I've got a wife. I've got two young kids. Um, I like spending time with them. We're going to play mini golf tomorrow. Um, as I promised my son, he wanted to go and play mini golf. So we're doing family day tomorrow. Nice. I enjoy dentistry. I enjoy my family. I enjoy playing, you know, sport, gym, all those bits and pieces. Um, try to keep myself active. Uh, recently moved into a new house. Not this one. This is a green screen. Um, in case you're thinking, my office is still a little bit of a mess. So green screen still up. Um, but yeah, recently moved into a new house. So just trying to do all the odd ends and working around that. The house is like another child too, right? You got to take care of that. And yeah, I'm, I'm currently trying to fix the lawn in the backyard because uh, it's kind of a bit ruined from the previous people. But um, we'll get there. Well, tell us now. You know. Uh, the Ripe Global team, all some sponsors and friends. Just saw Lincoln, Chicago, Cam, all these. Uh, tell us a little about your dental life. You said you graduated from dental school in 2012. Tell mm -hmm. us a little about your journey, dental school and afterwards. Yeah. So in dental school, I was just your average, you know, student. I wasn't the top of the class. I was in the bottom of the class. Um, I always was very helpful with other students that would come to me and, you know, get help with various bits and pieces. I could always give people a lot of help, but, you know, doing the actual dentistry myself always was a bit more of a struggle. Graduated, okay. went to a practice that I thought was going to give me a lot of mentoring because that's what they said they were going to do. Didn't get any mentoring. Had to fly by the seat of my pants and just sort of do everything I could on my own. Started doing too many courses, too many CE courses. I ended up doing like 200 hours of CE wow. like every single year for a couple of years. Um, some good, some bad some in America, some in Australia. And I kind of quickly learned that I'm very passionate and good with restorative work, complex restorative work and, you know, communication and talking to patients and those kind of things. So I sort of narrowed my focus over 10 year period into more complex restorative work uh, and working with, with patients and then met Lincoln through that journey started doing a few of his courses that turned into helping teach some of his courses, which turned into me now running the restorative program with uh, Ripe Global, where I oversee and create the entire curriculum for the restorative fellowship. Love that description. I've used that. I've made some videos where um, I talk about my failed dreams of not being a professional basketball player, Mike, when actually mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm still in my gym clothes. I was working out before I was shooting threes. I still can knock down an NBA lane three. 
But I do share Dennis have it tough because you can go practice basketball. You can go practice golf. You can go make a meal and throw it away if it doesn't work out so well. But us dentists, we don't have that opportunity until Ripe Global. So yeah. just talk to us a minute about the Ripe Global experience and what it's doing for dentists. You're training people all over the world from their mm. own operatory. You may have some of my amazing nacho dentist, Dr. Nathan Adias. He's in your, uh, he's, he's an amazing practice owner. This is what I think dentistry is needed for years, right? Global's put it in front of dentists. You're the head of this restorative platform. Just tell people about this magic for those who don't know. Yeah. So like you said, it's basically like having a, a personal gym training program in your operatory that you could utilize at any point in time in order to further your career and to just practice all of the skills that you want to learn. So normally when you do any CE course, you will fly off to the other side of the country, you will go to a hotel, you'll use some models in a hotel you know, lobby or a hall or whatever. You're holding it in your hand, you're doing a little bit of work like this. And then you go, oh yeah, I learned some skills. And then you fly back on a Monday and you've completely forgotten everything because it doesn't transfer. The skills don't transfer very easily because you're in a foreign environment using their materials, their instruments. Sometimes they're using shortcuts, like you have compressed air out of a can. You're using spray right. bottle of water. You're, you're not actually using electric hand pieces. You're using slow speed hand pieces and it's pre-prepped teeth and all these different things. So how much you actually learn and how much can you actually transfer into your actual normal office that you work out of. Whereas with us, because you do all of the hands-on in your operatory that you work in on a Monday, so on a Saturday, you work with your chair, with your staff, if you want to, using your instruments, your materials. So come game day, you just yeah. take the mannequin out of the chair, you put the patient's head in, and it's just copy and paste. All that changes is the patient is now alive rather than the mannequin. The skills are the same. The hand pieces are the same. The yeah. birds are the same. Everything is the same. So you're basically doing a dry run of the actual work that you're going to do. So like a rehearsal, a practice run. So come game day, you can actually just perform. Yeah, I mean, that this is just, it's so transformative. I'm so lucky that I found Ripe Global and they constantly say how lucky they are to find me. Don't, don't, don't ask them. Just take their word for it. And no, I'm just uh, joking. And I'm so glad we're bringing this to Dennis. The content we're going to deliver, I came up a little bit with this title. I like catchy titles, you know. The dental school, school let you down with your clinical experience. So one thing I'll share is one of my um, amazing dentist friends, he is in his 60s, graduated dental school in 85, and he did 60 crown preps, and he 60 crowns in dental school. And he hired a new associate who did four crowns in dental school. And he said, how do I do this, Paul? Like, you know, he's a educator. He's good. Let's just talk for a minute as we kick this off. Doing faster crown preps. I know dentists say it doesn't matter how long it takes, but it matters for many people, including the patient. Because if all of us went to a restaurant, we said, hey, there's a really nice server over here who's going to take two hours for your food. And then there's an experienced server that's going to take 20 minutes and you're going to get the same food. Not many people are going to sign up for that two hour server, are they, Michael? No, no, they're not. And, and like you said, there's every dentist wants to be a perfectionist. But then there's the real world which we live in, which is you have a set amount of time to do a procedure. You can't take two and a half hours okay. to do a clusal reduction because your patient's just going to die of boredom during that time. It's just and your not assistant. practical. And not Don't possible. forget about your assistant, right? Because and your assistant, assistant, they're going to fall asleep on you. I mean, it's bad enough when you do a root canal and they fall asleep. But you know, during an actual crown prep procedure, you need them to be awake. Right. Um, so you need to do all these things in an efficient manner because there's so much more that goes into a crown prep procedure than the actual crown prep. Everyone goes, oh, it's a right. crown prep procedure. I need to focus on the crown prep. And then they spend, you know, let's say they book two hours for it and they spend 90 minutes to do the crown prep. Right. And then they struggle with the fundamentals of taking impression, placing retraction cord, making a temporary and they're the things that make the difference because if you have the most amazing crown prep, but your impression or your digital scan is bad, right. then your crown is never going to fit properly. So it doesn't matter how good your prep is if you can't transfer that information to the lab or to your scanner or to whatever you're sort of doing. So you need to be able to do a good crown prep 
in a good amount of time. So you have enough time in your appointment to do all the other things that matter. Yeah, and I, then I you couldn't agree with your that. appointment from two hours to an hour. Suddenly you have twice as much time in your day to do dentistry or have more coffee or see more patients or whatever you want to do. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I have only once in my career, uh, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, I always say no patient wants to sit in the chair longer, but when I was a new dentist, Michael, I would see some evenings. I had a 7 PM appointment. I would always, you know, try to, um, you know, what, what do they say? Over deliver and under, under promise. So I said to this nice young patient, you know, maybe the same age as me at the time, 30, I said, you know, it's going to take an hour for your filling. It's going to take an hour. And 20 minutes later, I proudly sat her up and I said, we're done thinking that she was going to be excited. And she goes, I'm a brand new mom. This is the only break in my day. Could you take longer? I said, it was just amazing. And I said, you can sit here and lie to your family if you want. But besides her, I have a 99.99999% success rate of patients wanting to be out of the chair sooner. So I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, yeah. Faster crown preps, you're going to do an awesome presentation. We'll do a Q&A at the end. I want to share if you're watching live, watching on Dental Nachos Facebook, watching on demand. If you text RIPE, R-I-P, to 215-543-6454, Michael and the right team will get you access to this recording. So I'm going to stop my share. Michael, I'll let you come back up here. I Make also share it. Yeah. I tell people, people also, because you have a great hair there, Michael. I always say, when I used to start my lectures, I'd say, when you will get your hair cut, do you want the best haircut ever? Do you want the stylist and barber to try their best? Raise your hand for the best haircut ever. And I go, keep it up. If it's okay, if it takes four hours, everyone puts their hand down. And I go, well, that's dentistry. So I think there's no more perfect example of you saying you have a time to do a procedure and they do not teach this in dental school. And in fact, I send, I think they send you in the wrong direction. They say, just take as long as you need to be perfect. And the real world is not like that. So your yeah. show here, Michael, I'll be back on later. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Paul. All right. So where do we start? So basically, like uh, Paul was saying, we are here to talk about speeding up your crown prep procedures, your appointments, because there's so much more that goes into it than just a crown prep. So it's always good to have a goal in mind. Now, when I book for a crown prep procedure, regardless of if I'm making the crown myself in-house or if I'm sending it out to the lab for someone else to make it, I book roughly about 60 minutes. Now, that is for the prep, prep and meal, prep and place temporary, regardless of what we sort of do from there. I then roughly book about 30 to 40 minutes for inserting the crown, generally about the same for a cemented crown versus a bonded crown as well. The difference being that I might take a little bit longer if it's a little bit more of a complex patient or it, let's say if it's a lower molar and they're going to be a little bit more complex to place rubber dam or uh, use the local anesthetic, all those kind of things, I might extend the appointment a little bit from there. All of these appointments also take into consideration having enough time for your staff or your nurse to turn the room over to clean everything up and get it set up for the next patient. Now, for those, for those of you who are in America and have multiple different rooms that you work out of, you could move to the next room while it's being cleaned and then come back to it. In Australia and in a lot of other places in the world, we don't always have that luxury. And so I have the one room and I have to include the time it takes to clean the room into my appointments. Otherwise, I will run late. So if I have a 60 minute appointment and it takes me 60 minutes to do the work, there's an additional five to 10 minutes to clean up the room afterwards. And so I will run late if every appointment is booked exactly how long it takes me to do the work. It needs to be the work plus the actual cleanup that is required as well. So why do we actually bother with having things to be more efficient and faster? I don't like using the word faster because it implies that we're cutting corners or we're just speeding through it. I try to use the word more efficient, especially with my patients. A lot of the time I say, oh, that was really fast. So yes, but I was very efficient in what I did. And they go, oh, okay. It makes a lot more sense rather than I was faster, therefore I was cutting corners or doing something that I, I shouldn't have been doing. 
So we want to have more time at the end of our appointment for records. We don't want to spend two hours on a crown prep and then an additional hour and a half or an hour for taking our records, taking our photos, taking our, uh, our scans, our impressions, all those kind of things. We want to have all of that time within the appointment with also enough time to redo things if required. A lot of the times with impressions, you have an air bubble, you have a drag mark and you have to redo it. With digital scanners these days, you can just cut that bit out and redo it. So it's a little bit easier, a little bit more forgiving. I've been able to cut down my appointment time by utilizing digital scanners a lot more than uh, impressions. I still do impressions, especially for denture work or any crowns that involve denture work, like any precision dentures or anything like that. Uh, I will use a physical impression. Actually, I'm doing one next week. But that's with uh, an implant um, denture system using locators and stuff like that we need to have enough time to correct all these mistakes that can happen like i said with digital scans it's a lot faster a lot easier to correct any mistakes however they still happen you still need the time to redo things with any crown i always do a full arch scan because it's so quick and efficient you want to give the lab or yourself matter if it doesn't matter if you're designing it or not enough information that you can actually work predictably. If you're designing the crown yourself and you've only taken a quadrant scan, there is the possibility that the software is going to stitch things together weirdly. And it's happened to me many times. And it leads to the bite either being too heavy or too light. And then you spend far too much time adjusting the occlusion afterwards. Now, this isn't a lecture on how to do a seric restoration or how to do your own lab work. I've got other lectures about that on the Wipe Global website, which you can uh, watch in your own time after you've joined, after you've sort of gone through um, all of the other bits and pieces regarding to getting your cramp preps nice and quick and efficient. You can then learn how to do all the other steps quite efficiently as well. It's also about patient management. Like Paul was saying, no one wants to have the best experience that's dragged on and on and on and on. Once the procedure is done, they're done and they want to leave. No one enjoys getting these kind of procedures done. And people that do, they just enjoy the fact that they're having some time to themselves or lying back watching TV if you've got a TV on the ceiling or just interacting with you as a person not because you're doing the dentistry. No one's going to enjoy getting the actual procedure itself done. They enjoy the outcome. They enjoy the company. They enjoy the peace and quiet from their kids, their family, their work, whatever it is. But the actual procedure itself, they want that over and done with as quickly as possible. There are some procedures that are going to take a bit longer than others. But still, we want to be as efficient as we can so the patient doesn't have a negative experience that is dragged on and on and on. A short duration is fine. A long duration of a negative experience just wears the patient down and wears you down as well. We want to have more appointment left so that you can do a temporary. If anyone's done more than a single tooth temporary recently, you understand that it takes a long time to make a good quality temporary. Temporary, Sometimes for a very aesthetically demanding patient or for a very exact case where you have to get the temporary to be absolutely perfect because you are going to completely destroy the gums if your temporary isn't perfect or you need to make a good temporary because their gums are already destroyed their gums bleed like crazy and you just manage to get it under control and so you want to have a really good temporary so that the gums can heal before you see the next appointment to place your final crown because if they don't you're not going to be able to place your final crown. You need to make sure that your temporary is very clean, hygienic, and smooth. And in that case, you need to spend time to make sure that it actually fits well and is smooth and has all those things. If you have multiple crowns that you're doing, then you need to make sure that you have enough time because it's not something where it takes you 10 minutes to make a single temporary and it's going to take you 20 minutes to make two. Sometimes it actually takes you three, four, five times as long to do multiple temporaries because of path of insertion issues, which hopefully you won't have, but path of insertion issues or trying to 
clean out the embrasures so that they can clean and floss and use interdental brushes all throughout that temporary. It works even, it's even more difficult when you're doing a full arch of temporaries. A full arch of temporaries can take an hour to 90 minutes on itself to make them look nice and be predictable. So there's no economies of scale when you're making temporaries. The more temporaries you do, the longer it takes. And so it's important to make sure that you're efficient with the first part of the procedure because that second part, you can't really make that happen any faster. It just needs to be a good temporary, regardless of how long it takes. And for some patients and for some people, it's gonna take far longer to do that temporary than it does with others. And if you are more efficient at doing your crown preps, you'll find that you can fit more procedures into your day and into your appointment book. Now that doesn't mean that you have to do that, if you've made whatever income that you want to make for that day, that's fine. You can have a bit of a break or you can do some procedures that you do for the fun of it or for yourself as a dentist. A lot of the time, dentists will you know, see things that us educators do online, like put stains in occlusal fissures when we're doing an uh, occlusal you know, composite restoration. And they go, there's no point in that. It is absolutely silly. It serves no purpose. The patient's going to think they they have decay and they're going to come back and get the filling done again. And you know what? There is no point to it. I don't teach that there is a point to it. The only reason that I do it is for the pride in the work that I do. Do I do it routinely in day-to-day -day patients? No. Do I do it when I have the time to be like, I'm doing this occlusal filling as perfectly as humanly possible for the art of doing a good occlusal filling for myself as a human being so that I get the joy out of it, then yes, I do it for that purpose because it's a bit of, you know, art. It's something that we do for ourselves, for other dentists, for Instagram. It's not something that is required for the patient. Obviously, you got to let the patient know. And most of my patients in Australia have brown stains in all their fissures and they want things to match. So I just make it all blend in and it'll just tends to fade away and not have any issues there. Okay, so what is the recipe or the method that I use for making sure that I'm as efficient as possible in my crown prep appointments, okay? So we first wanna prepare everything. That's yourself, the patient, the room, the nurse, Everything needs to be prepared beforehand so that you have a plan of action when you go in. You know exactly who's doing what, when it's happening, why it's happening, and how you're going to manage that particular situation because every crown prep is going to be different. There are variations of the same, but how are you going to manage the patient that you need to sedate versus the patient that you don't sedate? How do you manage the patient that is anxious but doesn't need or want sedatives? How do you manage the patient that is a has a very large tongue? How do you manage the patient that gags a lot more easily? How do you manage that patient that can only be laid back what seems to be like one degree from upright, basically? How do you manage all those kind of things? You need to have a game plan before you go in, have that little huddle with your staff and be like, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to attack it. This is when I need you to do this, this, and this so that you have a very efficient strategy. There's a saying in many different languages in my sort of um, background from being Greek, my mother would tell me in Greek that you were going, it always was when I was being taken to school. Uh, my mother was notoriously late in taking me to school every day and picking me up from school as well. And so one of the sayings that she would say when I would be like, hey, can you hurry up? Because we're trying to get to school. She goes, no, no, no. I'm going slow because I want to be fast. Because if I go really fast and we crash the car, then suddenly you're not getting to school on time or at all. So I'm going slowly so that I can go fast. Essentially, what you want to do is you want to go as slowly as possible so that you can be predictable and precise with your actions so that you don't make a mistake that you then have to go back and repeat because that's what takes far longer. It's not the fact that you actually go really, really quickly and speed through everything. 
that gets you to the end result faster. It's the fact that you methodically do each and every step perfectly before moving on to the next step so that you can do the best result possible. We want to make sure that the patient has adequate local anesthetic and test it before we go ahead with the procedure so that everything works, they're numb, they're not having any issues, and you can comfortably do the procedure without having any interruptions. Make sure you select your appropriate burrs. I'm going to go through this in a bit more detail in a sec. You prep once. I'll go through questions um, at the end unless there's anything that's super urgent. You want to prep things once. You don't want to have to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth too many times. And then you want to make sure you do your core and you've got your retraction, your impression and your temporization, which we won't dwell too much on on that last bit. All right. So for preparation, so you want to make sure that your room is kept stocked. So you want to have all of the equipment and the instruments and the materials that you need for that procedure in your room at the start of the appointment. If during the appointment, your nurse, your staff need to leave the room to go and get something, it means that it wasn't set up properly or correctly. So make sure you have a record of what needs to be in that room. And most of you will have done these procedures often enough that you know exactly what you need. If every time you do a crown prep, you scan the prep afterwards, then make sure that the scanner is actually in the room at the time of doing the procedure. So you're not having to wait two to three to five minutes for them to go and get the scanner, bring it in, turn the computer on, set it all up, put the patient's details in, and then start scanning. Make sure it's all set up beforehand. Make sure that if you are using impression material, it's in date, it's ready to go. Everything is where it's supposed to be. If you're using a retraction cord, how many retraction cords? Is it going to be put in some sort of hemostatic agent? Have that out. Make sure it's cut to the appropriate length. Everyone knows the rough length that you need to cut for a molar versus a premolar versus a central incisor. Make sure all of those things are done beforehand because there's efficiency in having it all set up and ready. If there's anything that isn't set up correctly, make sure it goes onto a checklist so that there's accountability. You know exactly what needs to be set up for each different type of procedure that you're doing. And as the nurse is going through and setting everything up, they can check it off. They're like, okay, I've set this up, I've set this up, I've set this up. So if you get a different nurse in that room on a different day, you can make sure that everything will happen the exact same way. If you have the same nurse every single day, that's great. But what happens when they're away, they're sick, they retire, then you need to get someone else in and you need to make sure you still have that efficiency because the patient's coming in and they don't care that someone is sick. They care that they get the same experience no matter what provider or what nurse that they have, okay? Make sure you're training your staff so that they do have those efficiencies in mind. One of the things that, uh, one of the stories I like to say is I really enjoy my coffee. You can see there's a nice photo of the coffee there. This is a coffee from one of my favorite cafes near work. It's about five minutes from work, just a five minute walk from the, uh, the dental office. One of the best coffees I've ever had is obviously in Italy. One of the second best coffees I've had is at this cafe near work. Now, the owner was the one who was always doing all of the coffees. He was the one behind the machine. He's the one that greets you with a smile. He talks to you. You know him by name. His name is Paul. And what happened one day is I that's went a, that's, in. That's a because, great name. That's a great name, Michael. It is a great name. Yeah. yeah. Um, different to Paul, to this, this Paul, but still a great name. One of the things that happened is I walked in and because the cafe had grown in popularity, he had to get more staff in. And so there was a junior, a junior barista behind the coffee machine and the quality of the coffee wasn't the same, but I was like, okay, he's new, they, they need to learn. So I kept going back and, you know, I'd give him some feedback every now and then. And eventually the coffee would be relatively to the same standard as the owner. Obviously the owner's got a lot more experience, so it takes far longer to get to that point. But you need to make sure that you're training your staff so that they can give the same level of experience that you would also give 
to your patients and the same level of efficiency. You don't want your staff to be really, really slow at doing something. Like it takes them four hours to walk to the other side of the room when a different staff member will do it in half the time. Make sure everyone is as consistent as you can be. With patients, if required, use sedatives based on wherever you are in the world, whether it's going to be an oral sedative, IV sedation, or if they're super nervous and you have access to it, you can use a general anesthetic. Generally, we don't need to do that much general anesthetic for restorative dentistry, but do whatever is required to get the patient to be comfortable so that you can do the procedure uninterrupted. I try to get my patients to be as close to a dental mannequin as possible. So we'll sedate them if required. I don't sedate every patient. Make sure that they're numb so they're not feeling anything. They're watching TV. I'm using rubber dam. I'm doing everything that is required to get the patient out of the equation so that I can do the best possible job I can on the teeth. If I'm sitting there fighting tongues and gagging and patients being super anxious and worried, it's going to be very difficult for me to be efficient and do a good quality restoration or do a good quality cramp prep. There are some patients where you just need to get in there and get it done as quickly as possible because that's the only thing that's going to keep both of you sane. And that's fine. We all have those kind of patients. But for the day-to-day -day patients, you just need to do whatever is required to get them comfortable. Now, I'll probably sedate about, I'll probably say about 10 to 20% of my patients will use some sort of uh, sedative option. About 5% of those will be a IV sedation. We get someone to come in and, uh, you know, put a drip in their arm and knock them out. And the other ones are just using an oral sedative um, that we give them at the dental office. And then uh, they stay with us during that period of time and get someone to pick them up. The vast majority of these patients are extremely anxious and they've had previous negative experiences at other practices and thus they require the sedatives. Most of these patients are very easy to convert into non-sedative patients just by being nice to them, being efficient, not hurting them and just showing them the good things that have changed in dentistry over the last decade um, since the last time that they had dental work done and just show that we're not horrible human beings. It's not a nice experience, but we can get them comfortable and get things done as quickly as we can. And just make sure you're using the appropriate procedure for the appropriate patient as well. And make sure you know yourself as well. If you can't do a certain type of procedure, then maybe don't do that procedure. If you don't know how to do a prep or a vertical margin preparation, maybe don't pick that super anxious patient that has their wisdom tooth that needs a crown prep to be done on it for your first time ever to do that kind of procedure. Maybe do it on a mannequin through the right global training program to make sure that you can practice these procedures in a comfortable way so that when it comes to working on your patients, you're not doing things for the first time on people that kind of need all of your focus and your attention on them as a person and not sitting there focusing on the actual dentistry and not knowing what to do and just umming and ahhing about all the work that you do. Okay, so when we're going slow to go fast, we want to do each part of the procedure efficiently and slowly so that we can move on to the next one once the first bit is done. Most of the time, people will do a little bit of local anesthetic and then they'll start prepping and then they'll realize that the patient isn't numb. So they'll go back and they'll numb them up a little bit more and then they'll come back and then they'll prep a little bit more and then they realize that they should have waited a little bit longer and then they go back and then they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. During this time, you've lost the patient's trust. You've also lost a lot of time. If you had just done the local anesthetic, waited for the amount of time that you need to wait for that local anesthetic that you're using to work, and then tested the tooth to make sure that the local anesthetic has worked before you start drilling and saying that to the patient, I'm going to test to make sure that this has worked before I start drilling. Patients go, okay, that makes a lot of sense. If I feel something, it means that we're just going to go back to the local anesthetic part. 
we're not going to do something that's going to cause more pain. So I use the same stuff that you do to you when you do your cold testing for um, endodontics. So I place a endofrost cold cotton pellet onto the tooth. If they feel nothing and it was a vital tooth obviously beforehand, then we proceed. If they do feel something, then depending on how much they feel, I either wait a little bit longer or I top up the anesthetic. It's the same thing with all the other parts of the procedure. Make sure you do your occlusal reduction. Check that you have enough clearance, then move on to the next step. There's no point doing an occlusal reduction, then going and doing something else, and then finding out that you have lost your um, space, and then you need to go back to the occlusal reduction and then refine your prep again because you've shortened everything, and now you've changed your resistance and retention form and all those bits and pieces. So with local anesthetic, if you have a very long procedure, so if you're doing multiple crowns and you know you're going to be taking, you know, an hour, two hours for those kind of procedures, then you need to make sure that you have adequate local anesthetic to cover you for that amount of time. Generally, when you add a second or a third block or infiltration, you're going to increase the amount of time that that local anesthetic is working by about half the half-life of that local anesthetic. So for articane, let's say it will last for about three to four hours for most patients, some closer to two, some closer to eight. But if you add a second carpal of local anesthetic for an infiltration, let's say, then instead of four hours, you're going to get six hours of duration. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to have a six-hour procedure. It means that if your procedure falls within that time, that's fine. And then you can obviously extend things from there. They're also going to be numb when they get home so that they don't have any pain during that time as well. When you're doing upper molars, make sure you do a buccal and a palatal infiltration. I know palatal infiltrations are very uncomfortable for patients, but what's more uncomfortable is if there is in a separate innovation to that palatal root, what you'll find is the buccal infiltration won't be able to penetrate through the maxillary sinus and onto that palatal root, and there'll be discomfort there. There'll also be discomfort on the palatal from any rubber dam clamps that you're doing, any retraction on the gingiva that you're doing on that side, as well as if you needed to use a laser, trim away gingiva, or do any other work involving the gingiva on that side, you need to make sure that you have adequate anesthesia. We always do, a, when we're doing a, a block on the lower, we're always anesthetizing the lingual section. On the upper, we just got to make sure we anesthetize the palatal section as well. And obviously, patients that are more difficult to use local anesthetic on, you might need to use some adjuncts. So patient, I've got a few videos on my um, Instagram about extra local anesthetic measures that you can do, so I won't dwell too much on that. Make sure you use the right burr for the work that you're doing. A lot of the time, I see students and dentists, they'll pick the smallest possible burr that they have in their arsenal to do a massive, massive filling. They'll see that there's a great big hole the size of the Grand Canyon in this tooth, and they'll pick the smallest fissure burr diamond that they have available to them or a small little round burr because they're trying to be conservative. The thing is, after you've done, you know, more than three fillings in your entire existence, you kind of understand that there's a bigger hole on the inside than what you can see on the outside. You can start to see how big that cavity is going to be before you actually prep it. So make sure you use the largest possible birth for the work that you're doing so that you can be as efficient as possible and remove as much material as you need to. If you are doing a 0.5 millimeter chamfer, you will need to use a burr that is twice as large as that. The reason being is when you're doing a chamfer preparation, you're only using half of the burr into the margin to create the margin. If you want to create a larger margin, you need to use a larger diameter burr. If you use the smaller diameter burr and put it closer into the margin, what you'll get is a little J preparation where it's that little kick of the burr 
causing that little nick on the, um, the end, which we'll show in a couple of slides time. So make sure you're prepping things once with the right fur. So probably recently saw my little animation that I put up on Instagram. So I'll go through it in a little bit more detail. So the first thing that you want to do is you have this tooth, it has cracks and it has an old amalgam that you know you're going to replace. So you're going to do your, after you've numbed up the patient, you've done all those bits and pieces, you're going to do your occlusal reduction through whatever is there to start with, okay? The reason why we want to do our occlusal reduction first is because when we replace the core on the inside, we don't want to have all of this extra material that we need to waste that's just going to be reduced from the occlusal reduction. If you do your occlusal reduction after you remove the core material that's there and then clean things up, you won't be able to, you'll have to just redo things again anyway. Lost my train of thought there. Okay, so then we remove the old core material and you inspect the tooth, make sure that everything that isn't original tooth structure is removed. The amount of times that people say to me, but what happens if I find that there is an old perforation into the canal, into the root canal? Now, I would rather find that out at the time of preparation that I can then do something about it, start a root canal, or temporize the tooth and bring the patient back in at a different appointment, review it, and then proceed with the procedure rather than just burying my head in the sand and then going, well, it was okay beforehand. It should be okay afterwards. And then because we've stirred things up, the patient then is in a lot of pain after the procedure. And it's not the fault of the previous dentist who actually caused the problem. It's your fault because you're the one who last touched the tooth. So I always take everything back to original tooth structure so I can inspect it. I get a photo so I can see things and then make whatever decisions I need to make from there. After I've done that, I will then place a new core. In this case, I'm just using, I normally use Paracore um, is what a lot of us use as part of the restorative program. You can use whatever you want, paste or flowable composite, depending on the size it is. This is also at the time where I do my immediate dentine sealing. If I'm doing more of an onlay style prep or an inlay or something like that, then I'll do immediate dentine sealing. And then we just refine the occlusal reduction. Now, I'm not refining it by redoing the exact same thing because I've only built my core material up to the level of the occlusal reduction that I've already done. So it's not like I'm 14 kilometers too high. I just need to level off the bumps that I've caused just by creating the core material. And 99% of the time, there is a tooth on either side of the tooth that we're going to be doing this crown prep on. Now, this is just for traditional style, 360 degree chamfer margin crowns or vertical preparation crowns or shoulder crown or whatever kind of margin that you're doing just a traditional 360 degree crown. Obviously, if you're doing an onlay style crown, a crown lay, an endo crown, whatever you want to call them, then this step is not really that relevant. You then will break the contacts using a thinner burr. The reason why we use a thinner burr is because it can actually pass through the tooth without damaging the teeth either side. In some cases, especially with upper molars where they're very, very close together, you might need to use something like a fender wedge or a matrix band or a guard wedge or whatever they're called wherever you are in the world just to protect the adjacent tooth so that you have a little bit of a separator between you and that tooth. Now, bear in mind, I have seen a lot of people pretend that it's not there and end up drilling straight through the metal and straight into the adjacent contact. So just because it's there doesn't mean the tooth is invulnerable. Invulnerable? invulnerable to any damage, just make sure that you're taking care as well. It's just an added layer of defense. It's not something that will completely prevent you from causing any damage. Once you have that small little margin that you've created, and sometimes you don't even create a margin at all, 
you then use the appropriate size burr, because now you can actually see through the contact correctly, to do the reduction that you need to do. And what you want to do is you want to do that reduction is in, in as few steps as possible. So you're not moving your hand, you're not moving your burr too many times and not being able to get a smooth margin all the way around. Most of the time, what people do is, especially if they're using a non-electric handpiece, so they're using an air turbine handpiece, the ones that we sort of got taught with in dental school, you'll find that they start, stop, start, stop, and you get lots of little dings in the margin. They get a very rough, uneven margin because of the start, stop. If you're using an electric handpiece or a red band handpiece or whatever you want to call them, then you can very smoothly and efficiently just pass the burr through the tooth and then carve out the margin from that tooth. In some cases, you need to stop and readjust your hand. So as part of the crown prep boot camp that you get for signing up from this lecture, then you will do an exercise where you basically are told to just drive the tooth, the tooth, drive the burr around the tooth in one motion, not caring if we hit anything else, just the actual practice of driving the tooth, the burr around the tooth. I keep saying driving a tooth. That would be really weird if you had a tooth car and you were just driving it around. The point of that is not because that's how you actually do crown preps, but it's the actual hand motion that you want to learn. A lot of the time, dentists are not holding their handpiece correctly. They're holding their handpiece way too close to the head of the handpiece, and they lack the control in being able to use the fine motor skills of their fingers to move and manipulate the actual head of the handpiece. By holding the handpiece a bit further back, then you have a lot more control over where your bird goes. If you're holding it right at the tip, you can only do very big exaggerated movements. And that's why a lot of people tend to get undercuts and weird angulations in their crowns is because they're using their shoulders and their elbows to manipulate the bird. They're not using their fingers so they're not getting fine control over the movements. Once you've done the initial reduction over everything, you're going to do your secondary planar reduction. You're also going to smooth things out, make any necessary changes that you need to do. And then that's pretty much it. If you want to smooth and polish it, you can. The smoother and more polished that the prep is, the nicer it looks on Instagram, but also the nicer it comes up on an impression and a scan. The nicer it is on an impression and a scan, the better it looks when the technician makes the models, the better it looks when the technician makes the models, the better result that they can make with their crown because they can see everything properly. The more care that you take in your work, it translate in, translates into the technician taking more care in their work. Because as much as we don't want to admit it, we're all human beings. And if you give the technician a very sloppy impression, a very sloppy crown prep, what they will say inside themselves is, why should I do my best possible work when this dentist doesn't even want to do their best possible work for this impression, this crown prep? I will do whatever I need to do to get this to fit. And that's where my job ends. I do not take no pride in this crown, no pride in this work, because the dentists themselves didn't take pride in their work. So if you do good quality work, your technician will do good quality work. And if you do bad quality work, your technician will do the bare minimum required to get a crown to you. So just do the best possible work that you can so that you can get the best possible result. Okay, so let's see a case. And this is just an everyday run of the mill case. It's nothing special. It's nothing amazing. So this is the patient where uh, I milled out a resin block because she had some pain on a tooth that needed a crown, but she couldn't afford to do a crown at that point in time. We left it for about a year and a half, mainly due to the global pandemic. And then she came back and we changed it over to a crown. The symptoms hadn't fully resolved with the resin, but they had reduced in severity with the resin. So we're heading in the right direction. A lot of the times with cracked teeth 
they don't fully resolve with just resin. They need something a bit more stiff, like a full crown or a zirconia or gold crown and Emacs, whatever kind of material that you want to do to get things to fit. So we do our local anesthetic. Now we do the local anesthetic as slowly as possible to make it comfortable. If you are not doing it slowly and you're doing it really, really quickly, you're going to expand the tissues and cause a lot of pain. It tends to be the expansion of the tissues that causes most of the pain. There is some pain from the, basically the pH of the local anesthetic, as well as the temperature of the anesthetic. If it's been kept in the fridge, it's going to be colder. It's going to be more jarring to the tissues. So you can do all those weird and wonderful things like warming up the local anesthetic, buffering the local anesthetic. All those things can be done to make it more comfortable. But the best thing that you can do to make it comfortable is by going slowly. So it should take you about a minute, minute and a half to do a infiltration, sometimes a bit longer with patients that are a little bit more um, anxious. Seems like a long time, but if you do it slowly and they're comfortable, their adrenaline is less high when they're actually doing it. Their heart rate is a bit lower. And so you're not going to get as much clearance of the local anesthetic during that time. And so your local anesthetic can last longer and work better and more efficiently. That's more of an anecdotal reference. Um, I don't know exactly if it works like that, but it does make a lot of physiological sense. If the patient is less anxious, the work, the local anesthetic is going to work better because they're not clearing things as quickly. I then, while the local anesthetic is working, because it takes sometimes up to five minutes, sometimes 10 minutes for the local anesthetic to work, I will scan the tooth, do any preoperative photos, any preoperative putties that I need for an impression, for a um, temporary, anything that I need to do to set myself up to do a good quality restoration, I will do all those things during the initial time that the local anesthetic is working. So the local anesthetic time plus the scan and the setup time is roughly about five minutes so that everything is ready to go. You're putting on your Optragat, you're putting on your rubber dam if you're doing that at that point in time. You're doing your shade photos. You're doing all those bits and pieces that you need to do in order to get yourself set up for your crown prep. You're going to do your initial prep, your initial reduction. Now, in this case, I already had done a core when I did the initial resin. So I didn't need to redo the core in this case. It took me roughly about eight minutes in order to clean up and get the margin roughly where I needed it to be. You can see that crack on the palatal there. It's the initial preparation. It doesn't take a very long time. It's very rough. You can see that there's a rough evenness of the margins and that's about it. No secondary plan of reduction, not very smooth, not super amazing. We then will polish and refine things. Now, a lot of you will see that photo and you'll go, there's a lot of burr marks still on there, okay? I left the burr marks on there because it didn't make a difference to the end result. You'll see with the the actual um, x-ray that I have, everything fits perfectly. There were no issues anywhere there. A lot of the time you only see these things if you take a photo. These burr marks are not visible under 3.5, 2.5, 4x magnification. You need to use a microscope or take a high quality photo and then blow it up for everyone around the world to see. And you don't have to show it to everyone all around the world like I do. You can just take a photo and look at it with your own eyes in the camera because the camera doesn't lie. Some of the times we will look at things with our own eyes, with our loops in our mirror, and you don't see things as clearly. You have very focused attention. I might be focusing my attention on this little area here where there is the retraction cord that is sticking out a little bit too much. I might be focusing my attention here where there's a bit of plaque on the margin that needs to be cleaned up, especially if I'm using a scanner because the scanner doesn't care if it's soft or hard. It all comes out as digital da data. And so it's not going to think that that is plaque. It's going to think it's part of the margin. You might say, well, what's happening with that crack there or these burr marks here or various different things. So if you aren't paying attention, then you will not see all the little bits and pieces at the time that you're doing them. But if you take a photo, you get to see everything because the camera isn't going to focus on one particular area. It focuses on everything as a whole. 
And the way that human beings work is when they're looking at something, they will focus on one little detail. When they're focusing on a photo or an artwork, they actually just scan things from the top to the bottom and they go through and they look at everything in great detail. And that's what we need to do as clinicians. It's very difficult to do when you're not trained to do it. The way you train yourself to do it is by taking photos of your work so that you can actually see things in their real form. And one of the things that you get as part of the Crown Prep Bootcamp is you get access to our photograph, a little mini photography course so that you can get the biggest uplift in your dental career that you possibly can do by taking good quality clinical photos that you can then use to accelerate your dental career. You can see all these little errors, you can see all these things and then give you the best possible result. Because me showing you this gives you a lot more information than me just showing you, you know, good quality crown preps that I've done. Very smooth, even margins everywhere. You, or a stone model with perfect margins all the way around. You're not going to learn as much as if I showed you something like this, where someone can go, well, that looks fine. I can see how someone could do that in that amount of time. If I showed you something that's absolutely perfect, that could also do in that amount of time, you wouldn't believe me that it's possible to do these things in that amount of time. So I'm showing you the everyday stuff as well, the warts and all. And you can see that, yes, you can see the burn marks, but it's an even smooth margin everywhere. It's not going to make a clinical difference because you can see burn marks. Okay, then we scan, then we design, we mill, we try in, if that's what you're doing. Otherwise, you take an impression. And during this amount of time, you're also placing your retraction cords, you're doing your temporary, you're taking your impression, all those bits and pieces, and then dismissing the patient. So if you have the workflow that you're making your crown in-house, this is the rough workflow that you're doing. And you can take a screenshot of this, take a photo of it if you want. So you're doing your local anesthetic. Everything that is in that sort of orange box is work that the dentist physically needs to be present for. I know in America that depending on what state you're in, the dental assistant can do a lot of the other bits and pieces for you. And so if that is the case, then these are the bits that the dentist only really needs to be present for. Other than that, it can be delegated. In some countries, you can also delegate the design mill adjustment, all of that to someone. And so that can also be done by someone else. In Australia, someone else can design, mill, adjust the, um, the ceramic, glaze it, put it in the furnace, give it a final polish. But the dentist has to be the one that does the top and the bottom bit. It's the same in a lot of other European countries and other places around the world. But in America, I know that it is a little bit different. So just make sure that I put that in there. So you're doing all those bits and pieces. Then during the middle portion where... I'm not required, I still actually do the work, but the patient itself themselves aren't required. I do that while the room is being cleaned up and then I come back, I'll see a different patient, I'll go into hygiene, do a hygiene check or whatever is required. And then once the crown is all finished, I come back and I do the other work. So because I'm not spending all of that time in that room with the patient, then I can be more efficient and do more of other, bit, other work. If I'm doing a lab crown so i'm sending it to the lab then it's the exact same amount of time that i'm using for things it's just that instead of designing milling scanning all those bits and pieces i'm making the temporary and sending the patient home and then i bring them back in the only difference is i need to make sure i do more local anesthetic the second time because they're not numb anymore it's been a couple of days a couple of weeks since their previous appointment and so I need to make sure that I numb them up again. You do your polish, your stain and glaze, whatever is required. You can use your little Fisher tints that you need there. And then you just make sure that you do all your photography as well. Okay. So like I said, it's better than using direct vision. You can see everything. You can see your margins better. You can see your path of insertion better. You avoid that mental bias of, I'm just going to focus on this one little thing and you miss everything else. You miss the actual big picture, the forest full of the trees. It's good for record keeping as well. So if the patient comes back and says, 
hey, I've got pain on this tooth that you did 17 years ago, you can say, hey, there was a crack in that tooth. Maybe that tooth actually now requires a different type of procedure than what I would have thought if I didn't have that photo. Because after a period of time, we forget what the inside of the tooth looks like. So if you have a photo, you can go back to it, you can review it, and you can change your future procedure based on what was there in the past. Your notes only go so far because you can say crack was present. That's great. What color was it? What direction was it? How deep was it? You can't explain that through writing it down very clearly. It's a lot easier to take a photo. So when you're taking a photo, you can see a lot of different pieces of information. You can see with your path of insertion that there is an external margin and an internal margin to your crown. So make sure that you can see both when you're figuring out your path of insertion so that you can actually get something without undercuts. Undercuts happen when the internal margin overlays or is closer to the external margin than is actually in real life. So when you look down from a camera or from a mirror, you'll be able to see, you can see over this side that you have your external margin there and then your internal margin is here, but it's blocked by this material that's here. So this part is the undercut because you can't see your internal margin clearly and efficiently there. So a little bit about photography. So the aperture obviously is just the size of the hole at the front that lets the light through. We go through this in a lot more detail during the Crown Prep Bootcamp and the photography mini course that you get. You want to just keep things roughly around about the 18 to 22 aperture for most clinical cameras. The shutter speed doesn't make a huge difference in dentistry as long as you're keeping it pretty much around the 1 over 125 to 1 over 250. Getting things really, really slow just means that it takes a long time for the shutter to close. And then you get a lot more artifacts or blurring and hand movements happening. And then the ISO is just the amount of detail that is going to be exposed onto the sensor of the camera. So we try to keep things to the lowest ISO that is possible. So we have as much detail in the zoomed in pictures as we can. The noisier the picture is, it means that you've increased the ISO to try and get a slightly brighter image, to try and get a bit more information. You, because we use flashes, we don't need to have a higher ISO. We can keep it quite low. And then if you need to, you can change the exposure compensation. But what that does is the camera digitally adjusts the image in order to compensate for something that it thinks it's too high or too low. So when you take a photo, the camera is doing a lot of mathematics in the background and going, okay, based on what I can see in this image, I need to make it brighter or lower, uh, brighter or darker. The exposure compensation is you manually saying, okay, I know you want to make it this bright. I want you to decrease that by one stop or two stops or three stops or make it brighter or whatever is required from there. We'll go a little bit faster. We don't need all of this information there. So then you want to isolate and then insert the crown. And if you have any issues with it being too tight and binding, what you can do is you can get some articulating paper, rub it on some floss and then pass it through the crown. And then it marks exactly where the high point is that is causing you to have that interference. This is for contacts. And then you adjust it with a lab handpiece and a stone or your burrs, whatever you want to do, then polish it again afterwards. And then you'll be able to get things to fit. So you can see here that after I adjusted it, I got it to fit. You can see a nice, clean, even margin there. And then we can isolate it and it all fits nicely. And then you can see it all fits perfectly. There's no issues, there's no gaps, nice and smooth. Another kind of patient, if you have a crown lay style preparation, you can see I also do work late at night. You're putting the fender wedges in, you're doing your occlusal reduction. You're not using a tiny burr, you're using the biggest possible burr and you can't do a big round movement like that. You sometimes will have to move your hand. You do your occlusal reduction on one side, you flip the burr over, you do your occlusal reduction on the other side. You smooth things out. If you have any issues, like you can see on the distal there, I have a little bit of a J prep. A J prep is where you pass the burr 
further than the halfway point into the tooth. And this is for a chamfer burr, so a round-ended burr. And you get that little hook of enamel or dentine on the edge of the margin. So in order to fix that, you need to use a flat-ended burr and then you can fix it from there. You can't use the same burr that created the J-PREP to fix the J-PREP. You can then place your core. You can see here, got a bit of decay underneath, remove all the old stuff, clean everything out back to original tooth structure, place your core material, smooth out as you need to. If you need to adjust the adjacent contact, because sometimes we need to hit the adjacent tooth on purpose, make sure you smooth it out so that it's not rough anywhere there. Use a disc or a burr, whatever is required. Smooth it out. This is more of a hybrid crown lay style thing with an Emacs. Use your attraction cord, your PTFE tape, whatever is required with this particular tooth. Old PFM, take it apart. Looks a bit gross and disgusting. Clean it up. Do any core material that you need to do. Place your attraction cord. Wait five to 10 minutes for the retraction cord to work. Placing a retraction cord, 30 seconds, and then taking it out does nothing. The more teeth that you're working on, the longer you need to wait. Not because it takes longer for more teeth, but you want to give yourself more time. Retraction cord after about five, 10 minutes will keep that margin open for about another sort of five, 10 minutes. If you leave for about 20 minutes, then you're going to get far longer time to redo a scan, redo an impression than if you left that retraction cord in for only five minutes. So when I'm doing multiple crowns, I'm leaving it for a few minutes. When I'm doing a full arch of crowns or a quadrant of crowns, I might leave it up for about 20 minutes or so, so that I get as much retraction as possible. In the literature, it does state that you shouldn't leave it for longer than 30 minutes especially if you're using a hemostatic agent with an astringent in there with like adrenaline or something like that, because it can choke off the blood supply to the tissues and can damage it if it's been there for longer than 30 minutes. So no more than 30 minutes, less than 20 minutes is perfectly safe for bigger procedures. But for run of the mill everyday procedures, five minutes is more than enough. So you leave it for enough time, you do your scan, you do your temporization. You can see that there's plenty of retraction there that I can scan and I can take photos. I can do all these things without the margin of the gingiva collapsing back onto the tooth margin there. Might need a bit of additional Teflon there, but otherwise it all fits in nicely. A little bit more cleanup required on that tooth. You can see it all fits in very nicely. All of these um, were done using the CERIC system. You can also do nice bridges in a very efficient manner. You can also do efficient onlay style inlays in the exact same way. So you do your occlusal reduction as you need to for the entire tooth here and just this portion of that tooth. You don't need to do occlusal reduction in another area because it's not needed. So you do your occlusal reduction there and then you can move on. And you place those in. And remember, it's not the fact that you take a lot of time and care to do your work. It's because you're going really, really slowly so that you do each and every step correctly and once that allows you to be efficient. So it seems weird that I'm talking about going slowly, but I'm also doing a crown prep in 10, 20 minutes, and then having everything done within 60 minutes of that procedure. So it seems very, very fast, but I'm telling you to go slow. And it's because you go slow and you do everything methodically that you can actually get efficiencies that make you do your work faster and more predictably. So in order to get you up to speed, like we were saying with Paul before, we want you to be able to practice a lot of these procedures in your own operatory, in your own time, so that you can grow as quickly as possible. So what we've created as a little package for all of you is we have a crown prep and photography boot camp that is a bonus. So it's in addition to the full, you know, two years of the fellowship, which you can do in as little as six months 
It's over 500 hours of CE for the full fellowship. So in addition to signing up for all of that, for everyone who signs up using the link here as part of the Dental Nachos community, you'll get a crown prep boot camp and a photography boot camp involved in that. And what you get is you get a mini version of the crown prep, the full crown prep course that you do so that you get a kickstart to everyone else in the program because you'll have practiced twice as many crown preps as they have. Okay. Now, Paul was saying that recent graduates are now doing four crown preps in their whole five years of their undergraduate dental university training. We do about 14 in one day on the first hands-on. So you learn far more in our boot camps and in our hands-on days than you would in your entire career as a dental student. The photography also so that we can teach you how to set up your camera, how to use your camera, how to take photos, because they're fundamental to how we teach, but also fundamental to how you learn as a clinician so that you can fast track your career because when you don't have someone over your shoulder looking at your work, you get a little bit sloppy. You don't know where your problems are because you can't see them. By taking the photo and just even showing it to yourself, you have that accountability that goes, well, this looks bad. This doesn't look as good as I can possibly do. What do I need to do to fix it? And either you fix it there and then, or you do additional work um, and training so that you can fix it for other patients in the future. So let's go through any questions that we have. Do you want to read them out, Paul? Or yeah, do you yeah, want sure. me I'll to... read them to you. I want to share. Sure. I have sat behind this screen watching many people present, including myself. This was one of the best presentations I've ever seen on a fundamental chip, as I'll call it, of what we need to do daily. Whether you are the superstar dentist or the new associate or the person covering at an office from attorney leave, being able to do a single tooth crown efficiently. I love how you said we didn't do it fast. We did it efficiently is so key. So um, some questions that I uh, want to bring up mm -hmm. in scanning or traditional impressions. You, I, you said you were going to do a traditional impression coming up. So both of them have relevancy in your dentist life. Yeah, they both have relevancy in my dental life. I'm actually doing a doing a lecture with Michael Melkers next week in Melbourne, Australia, where I'm talking about all of the digital side of occlusion and how that all falls into it. And he's doing more of the analog style of occlusion. But if I bring it down to one sentence, digital scanners are great at fixed firm tissues. So teeth, great. Gums that aren't moving, great. Where they fall short is anything that is mobile. So your floppy gum tissue, anything that requires compression, so your dentures, or anything that needs a pickup impression. So the one that I'm doing, I think it's next week, is locators for a implant-supported denture. And I also have, so it's a posterior denture. It's a, actually quite a weird case because she has implants that were placed by someone else that she refuses to tell me who placed them, what implants they were. And I had to go on a weird fact-finding mission to actually figure out what they were. But we're basically converting these failed implant bridges that she has in all posterior quadrants into a removable partial denture that has locators that click into it. So I did her anterior veneers and then we've got a precision denture on implants um, at the back. So you can't do that with a scanner. You can't do a pickup impression with a scanner, even though it would be super easy to scan that mouth. You physically can't do it because you need to pick up the locators and everything. So that's going to be with a physical impression. I still prefer in my hands to do multiple implant crowns with impressions and that's probably because I don't have the setup with all the little, um, you know, Atlantis has them and Nexus has them, those little basically battleships that you can screw onto implants yeah. when you're doing full arch cases. 
um, and the big sort of photography cameras, those digital cameras that you take and extra oral ones, digital scanners, the face ones. I don't have access to those at the moment. So for that reason, I stick to analog for multiple implant impressions um, and scans. Thanks Just because I've been burnt a few too many times with uh, crappy scans. But 99.9% .9 of my restorative work is digital scans. <laughs> Thanks for uh, clarifying that. And before we go to our next question, my team member, Morgan, is going to drop the clinical development tool. Um, mm -hmm. People who are watching it now, watching this on demand, it takes 10 minutes to fill out. It gets you, you also get a coupon for ripe um, courses from it. But that exercise of filling it out as a dentist, Michael, how does that help you self-evaluate, identify mm -hmm. weaknesses, point out strengths? Tell us about that clinical development tool they've developed. Yeah, so the clinical development tool is basically a way for you to treatment plan your dental career. So a lot of the times we get a patient that comes in and they're like, I just want you to fix my teeth. And you're like, that's great. Why? What's your goal? What do you want to get out of this? Because we all go to courses, we all do these things and we have no end goal in mind. Like, why are you bettering yourself? Are you trying to just be the best possible clinician that you yeah. can be? Do you want to spend more time with your family and less time doing clinical dentistry? If so, how much do you need to earn so that you can actually only work two, three, four days a week and spend more time with your family or traveling or all these different things. Because everyone always has that mindset of work-life balance. I need to, you know, work less and enjoy life more, but then they have a mortgage. They have this, right. their kids have, you know, sports and all these different things and you can't earn less. You've gotten yourself into a position where you have to earn a certain amount. And so if you want to take more time off, that's fine. You can work less, but you need to earn more during those less days that you do, which is what I've been doing lately. I only work three and a half days a week, but that's because the other two days I'm doing all this right global yeah. stuff. I love so that. So it treatment plans your career and it goes, okay, where are you at now? How comfortable are you doing these procedures? How does How is your knowledge base doing this? How is this? How is this? And then it gives you a score at the end and goes, okay, this is where you are. These are the steps that you need to take to take your career to the next level in this direction. And then you go, okay, well, I want to do some orthodontics. Okay, this is how you go down the orthodontics. Just like we tell patients, you want to have straight teeth that are white. In order to do that, you need to do this first, then this, then this, then this. So just treatment plans your career the same way that we treatment plan dental patients. I, I love that. I encourage you, if you're still here with people watching in, we're going to ask this question next, but go to the chat, just fill it out, sit there, fill it out. It's fun to fill out. You also get a coupon towards ripe training from our sponsor. Which bird do you use to get nice, well-defined margins? Any tips for margin margination? Uh, I always struggle with getting well-defined margins. So two parts to that question. So the burr I use, I had them all up on the screen before. Um, let me see if I can go back to it. Ah. I'll go back to it quickly. But the second part of that question is, margination you want to make sure that you have the appropriate retraction so that the scanner or the impression can see everything oh where is my oh there you go i'm gonna say where are you where's your face gone i'll put up my birds there everyone can see the birds nice. yeah more, so more all the birds i use are from comets uh the numbers are probably going to be different depending on where you are in the world but it's a 1.8 millimeter green band cylindrical diamond um high speeds chamfer burr so if you say that to your rep they should be able to tell you what it is you can take a screenshot of it this slide is in many many different lectures that i have on the website as well so um also if you do sign up you will get access to obviously all these lectures and you can see the recording of this as well Make sure that you are doing your initial reduction of your margins and your prep at the maximum speed that you can. So you're going to be 40,000 RPM. And in a red band handpiece, that translates to 200,000 RPM. You want to go smoothly through the margin. Let the burr do the work. Let the burr cut into the tooth. If you want to get really fancy about it, the burr is going to be spinning in a certain direction. 
So clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on what part of the tooth you're doing, you want to make sure that you are pushing the burr and following the margin in the direction that the burr is spinning so that it is cutting the most efficiently that it can. Now that is taking things to the next level. Don't start doing that thinking that it's going to change your dental career. Just start with just holding your handpiece correctly. Like we were saying, I'm just going to stop sharing so I can actually, sure. I've got a little, little more demo here. So if we pretend that this is our handpiece, if you hold it right at the front there, you can see that you can't really get a lot of movement with your fingers because you're so close to the head of the handpiece. If you hold it just that little bit further back, you can do little circles like that a lot easier. And you're not having to do big arm movements like this because your shoulder is a much bigger joint. And so most of the time dentists have weird angulations and what they call tapers on their preps because they're using their shoulder to actually move the burr. And so they can only do basically zero or 45 degrees. That's gotcha. all they can really do with their burr. They can't do one, two, three, four, five, six degrees of taper, which is what ideally we want. So you want to have the fine control on your fingers. And most dentists, after a few years of practicing, have a really fat muscle right here because of just doing this with their uh with their uh, their handpiece, especially if you have an electric or red band handpiece, you get really good at just doing. Is there that is there a, a dental drill to have better abs? Like while you're working, is there anything that you could do uh, to increase better your abs? abs? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, just sort of just yeah. instead of using a chair, just like squat the whole yeah, time yeah, 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 and just sort of like yes, yeah, yeah, yeah like that. Would work um, in the ergonomic world, but well, uh, yeah, you could just stand and just squat. There's a lot of dentists that actually do a lot of work just standing. Um, I know yeah, one yeah. dentist that does everything standing up. She she never sits down. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I've seen I've seen uh seen that. Well, you've shared tremendous value for us. We're honored to be part of what you're doing. I can't wait till you come to Philadelphia and join us. I just want to um, share with people share with people. Uh, we have a way to get in everything right. The landing pages Michael shared the deal. So if you just screenshot this, this is our text community. Text right to 215-543-6454. I'm going to say goodbye to the Dental Nachos Facebook live group here. And anyone in here who's still here is welcome to uh, ask him a question if you want to pop on. Michael, this was great. Are you going to work next or what do you have going on? Um, no, it's an admin day today. So it's just teaching. I am going to work at 1 p.m. I'm going to do a crown prep on my father. So oh, put nice. all these skills into action. Yeah, enjoy. Well, this was outstanding. Let's stay connected. I put some stuff on Instagram while you were speaking. Truly amazing job. Beautiful. All right. Thanks, Thanks so Paul. much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Okay. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.